Good morning. Welcome to the, uh, the King Institute for Faith and Culture this morning. Uh, we are delighted to be back after a series of cancellations uh, to a flurry of activity at the end of the semester. I have a couple of announcements, then I'll introduce our speaker for this morning. We are going to have uh, Mark and Karen Finley, who are with us uh, this morning, will be available for coffee afterwards at the Tadlock House, if you want to come by and spend some time with them. We'll be at lunch around noon in the cafeteria, and we'll be delighted if you want to come and be part of that as well. Mark will be speaking again tonight at 7 o'clock at Emmanuel Episcopal Church downtown. We have three further events coming up this fall. On November the 7th, we welcome, oh, sorry, four more. On October 31st, we have our fall faculty lecture. This is an old tradition at King where students elect two faculty members every year to give a talk and vice versa. And our faculty lecture on October 31st is Gail Helt. On November 7th, we will welcome journalist Daniel Silliman. He writes, uh, he's the news editor for Christianity Today and he's written a great deal uh, for them. He'll be here on the morning and the evening of November 7th. November 14th, we welcome an engineer called Lee Martin. Uh, Lee comes to us from the University of Tennessee. He is famous for inventing the 360 camera that you use if you're ever going to look at a property online. And he is also a national pickleball champion, and he's going to talk about that in the evening. So Lee will be with us on November 14th. Finally, November 30th, you get a chance to encounter uh, a national treasure in King graduate Catherine Patterson, the author of Bridge to Terabithia and Jacob Have I Love and a number of other well-loved children's books. Uh, she will be here, and on the 30th in the evening, she'll be on stage with two other Newberry Honored Children's Authors, Kimberly Brubaker Bradley and Stephanie Tolan. The following morning on a Thursday, she'll be here in chapel to read from her new memoir, Stories of My Life. Catherine turns 90 on Halloween, and she has written a play for King this year, which we will premiere in December as well. So she's quite a remarkable figure, and I hope you get a chance to meet her. This morning we welcome Mark and Karen Finley. Uh, they come to us from their home in Charleston, South Carolina, but they're originally from Northern Ireland. And their uh, life story is a story of calling, which is very much the theme of this year's speaker series. We're examining the way that God calls us to different things and what, that, what the dimensions of call might be. One of the things that strikes me in thinking about calling is how often it changes and how often it surprises us. And Mark and Karen's story is very much a, a, a story of how calling can come as a surprise and can shift uh, part way through your life. They have worked, uh, both of them worked in the peace process in Northern Ireland. They grew up during the troubles in Northern Ireland and uh, experienced a lot of the violence and dislocation of that uh, time period, but then worked to heal it. Following that work, they continued to work in the process of uh, dealing with Ireland, Irish people abroad, which brought them eventually to the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. From that moment, uh, eventually they found a call to come to D.C. itself, uh, to move across the Atlantic uh, in a kind of leap of faith and start work as ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors of reconciliation in Washington, D.C. So that work has involved them on Capitol Hill a great deal. It's also taken them all around the world. So he may uh, give us some of those stories this morning. I'm not sure where, the, where we're going to, what part of the calling story we'll hear from Mark this morning, but all of it is remarkable, and all of it is a great testimony to God's faithfulness. Please join me in welcoming Mark Finley. Well, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. And I will tell you some of our calling, but I want to talk first about your calling. Um, it said, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. That quote has been attributed to many people. My favorite iteration of it is from a very highbrow production. Some of you might know it. Ford versus Ferrari. Carol Shelby, the race car designer and engineer, 
addresses the, set, the assembled audience at the launch of a new Ford Mustang. And he says, when I was 10 years old, Pop said to me, son, it's truly a lucky man who knows what he wants to do in this world, because that man will never work a day in his life. He also said, if he was here, he would say, sit on down, son, and leave the yak into the college boys. So I'm not sure where that leaves us right now. I'm going to share some more. Howard Thurman said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And then go do that. Because the world needs people who have come alive. You all know who Howard Thurman was. He was a mentor to Martin Luther King. He started the first major interracial and interdenominational church in the United States. And he died in 1981, at the age of 81. I mention this because he was a mentor to Martin Luther King. Collect good mentors in your life who will help you to recognize and respond to God's call in your life. Are you actively collecting mentors? Show of hands, has anybody got a mentor? A few. Not enough. Howard Thurman was long before our time, but we're privileged to have another contemporary of Martin Luther King's. Nancy Harden is a mentor to us. Nancy is 92 years young and an amazing uh, prayer warrior, an African-American leader who stands on the wall for Karen and I and our daughter Grace. She has great empathy with Grace because Grace is now a fifth grade teacher and Nancy was a teacher. We stand on the gap, uh, in the gap, on the wall as Nancy puts it, guided by Ezekiel 22, a life verse that was given to me by another mentor, an Australian, who before he went to the Lord was very eager to pass on to me the idea that I sought for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it, and I find none. Often we hear quotes like that, and we don't look at the context. I looked at the context of that quote when it was given to me by my mentor. Before it, we read, I, I bring it, I have it written on a sticky post-it, I brought it with me. We read about a conspiracy of prophets devouring lives. Princes and leaders like wolves who are after dishonest gain, false visions, divining lies, extortion and robbery, oppressing the poor, extorting the foreigner. Sounds a lot like today. I wish I'd met Fred Beekner. I've heard about him from friends. I love the intersection that he describes that is the inspiration for your lecture series. The place God calls us to is the place where the world's deep hunger and your deep gladness meet. I enjoy Fred's writing style and the teaching that I get from the books. Another whose style and cadence and thoughtfulness that I really appreciate is my fellow Irishman, Oz Guinness, of the Guinness family. Sidebar, you should read the book, God and Guinness. But you should also read Oz's seminal book called, The Call. 
I highly recommend it to you. Oz tells us that calling is the truth that God calls us to himself decisively, that everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested with a special devotion, dynamism, and direction, lived out as a response to his summons and service. Did you hear that? Everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have invested. Everything. I'm seeing a lot of sports attire and hats. I'm guessing there's a lot of athletes here. Everything we do in life, including the roles that we have in sports and in the student body and in your homes and in the community. He later put it, everyone everywhere in everything should think, speak, live, and act entirely for God. No half measures. God is actively calling us as followers, followers of the way. They don't use the term Christian often in the Bible. More often they will refer to followers of the way. We come from Northern Ireland, and oftentimes people will say to us, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? We say we are followers of Jesus. It's not a casual suggestion to be a follower. Are you familiar with Oswald Chambers? Anybody familiar with Oswald Chambers? Uh, I thoroughly recommend his book, My Utmost for His Highest. Get it as an app on your iPhone or your uh, other smartphone, or better still, have a dog-eared copy and look at it regularly. On January 16, his devotional, he writes, God providentially weaves the threads of his call, your call, through our lives. And only we can distinguish them. Our dealings over our call of God should be kept exclusively between us and him. Are you hearing him? Are you listening? Who has he put in your way? Versus who is getting in the way? in your life. I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Paul writes, am I trying to win approval of human beings or of God? If you are still trying to please people, I, do not, I would not be a servant of Christ. And when God called him, I often look for the so that words, so that he would preach amongst the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go to Jerusalem to see the apostles. After three years, Paul went to see the apostles. If God is calling you in this room right now, you know it. You do not need to turn to your right or to your left to discuss that call. As, God, as Os, Os Guinness also put it, a life lived listening to the decisive call of God is a life lived before an audience of one. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by mercies of God, to present your body as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. If any of you are students of uh, hermeneutics or have studied the languages of Scripture 
And if any of you have got multiple different versions of the Bible, you will know that Bible translators struggle with this verse. It says spiritual worship. The King James says reasonable worship. The NIV talks about true and proper worship to give of yourself as a living sacrifice. A genuine expression of worship, another one puts it. The word comes from logikos or logiken, from which we get logical to follow your call. To give of yourself as a living sacrifice is the logical thing to do. I want to talk a little bit about the calling as a cup bearer because it was in the title. It kind of speaks to a bygone era. It alludes a little bit to my calling and I will share some of that before we finish. But it begs the question, what is a cupbearer? Where are they in our scriptural accounts? And where are the cupbearers today? And what is the equivalent? Well, I believe the first reference you will find in scripture is in Genesis 40. You remember the story? The cupbearer and the baker offended the Pharaoh. He was angry. The cupbearer and the baker are sent into jail under the custody of the captain of the guard where Joseph was imprisoned. What do we know about the butler? The cupbearer confined to jail. The story of Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat. Of course, Joseph is not a flight of fancy of Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's an historical account. I met a lot of history students here. There I was standing in front of a vine. I picked some grapes and I crushed them to wine. I gave them to Pharaoh. He drank from my cup. I tried to interpret, but I had to give up. I am familiar, as Karen will attest, to this lyric because I performed it in a Knock Presbyterian Church production in Belfast some 15 years ago. Clearly not headline building or a Broadway run. But in all seriousness, I say to you, there are no bit parts in God's story. He is using you all, and he will use you all. Are you listening to his call? But back to the butler. We don't know his name. He didn't even remember Joseph's name. But he got out of jail, as Joseph said he would. It transpires the fickle pharaoh was going to throw a party. So what do you do? Oh, where's my cupbearer when I need him? Uh, pharaoh, you put him in jail. Oh. He comes out of jail, unlike the poor baker. <coughs> so the cupbearer is there in the right place at the right time, a close aide, an attendant, who testified to Pharaoh of Joseph's God-given talents in interpreting dreams. The cupbearer enabled Joseph to transform from prisoner to the right-hand man of Pharaoh, another cupbearer. Joseph is the story of God's planning of redemption and of forgiveness. We were talking last night, there's a scripture that was quoted a lot during COVID, and I got tired of the fact that it was misquoted nearly every time I heard it, whether it was on ABC, Fox, or CNN talking about this idea that we've got a terrible situation, but that God is turning it for good. That's not what Genesis 50-20 says. As for you, you meant evil against me, Joseph speaking to his brothers. But God meant it for good. Not he turned it 
for good. He meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should live as they are today. So what are the attributes of a cupbearer? An attendant, an aide de camp. Again, the translators and the hermeneutics struggle over the term. We read a myriad of job descriptions throughout Scripture, all really referring to this same function and role, most of which have the same characteristics. We read about eunuchs, chamberlain, wise men, managers of household affairs, city treasurers, and directors of public works, all translations of the same thing. Each of those roles has proximity to power. They are positions of service where you have the ear of the leader. You enjoy unfettered access. You are a constant companion. And typically, cupbearers become friends and confidants of the leaders that they serve. Right the way through, look for yourself. Genesis 37, they talk about an officer of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's official, a manager of his household affairs. Genesis 39, Potiphar, who was actually, in essence, a chamberlain to the, uh, to the Pharaoh, where the butler served the chamberlain and the chamberlain served the Pharaoh. As a result of the butler's actions. Joseph got put in above the chamberlain under Pharaoh. A captain of the guard is another term. In Isaiah 39, Isaiah admonishes the king, Hezekiah, and tells him because of his failing that some of your family will be taken away and will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Let me tell you, there's nobody wants to speak or preach about eunuchs. Perhaps uh, the same number of people who would like to speak about circumcision. By the way, one of my mentors admonished me in that scripture. He used it with effect to tell me to be more circumspect about sharing too much information with people. We read it in the story of Esther, seven eunuchs, seven wise men, seven princes who understood the times and knew what to do, that the leader turned to them. Chamberlain, again, like cupbearer, sounds like an old word. Did any of you watch Queen Elizabeth's funeral or perhaps Meghan and Harry's wedding? Some of you might watch the coronation of the new king. The Lord Chamberlain in the United Kingdom's job is to organize those ceremonial events, just like the butler was brought out of jail to organize the party for the king. At the end of the Queen's funeral, the Lord Chamberlain broke his wand of office and laid it on Her Majesty's coffin as it was taken down into the crypt, marking the end of his service to His late Majesty. I communicate this role about Chamberlain because it's not an old word, it still exists, but I also I want you to start to think about who are those who enjoy proximity to power and how you can use it in your call. Executive assistants, chiefs of staff, coaches in sports, special assistants to the president, special advisors to prime ministers and to cabinet members, of course, we pray for all those people in those positions. I have experienced what Oswald Chambers described about the weaving of threads. It was late in our life along the way when I finally listened to the call. Early in my life, I did have a strong affinity with the Joseph story. I maintained a confident expectation that I would engage with leaders. I was a child. Some 20 years 
ago, a prophetic pe preacher in Northern Ireland spoke over me things that had happened, were happening, that only Karen and I knew about, and things that would happen. You will minister to kings, presidents, prime ministers, and stars. A pastor friend said to me, we call this reading your mail. He gave me a scripture, the sovereign Lord has given you a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary, wakens me morning by morning, an ear to listen like one being instructed. And another verse, on my account you will be brought before governors and kings to witness to them and to Gentiles. Do not worry what you will say or how you will say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. Our story in Northern Ireland, I was in the construction and development world. It took me to Scotland, where at the age of 30, I was responsible for a multi-million dollar development program and investment vehicles. I was responsible for redeveloping a nuclear submarine base, as you do, through which I hosted His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, and also the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who would later become Prime Minister. That led to my being appointed as a commissioner of the Port of Belfast, because Gordon Brown spoke to his cabinet colleague in Northern Ireland about the work that I was doing in the port of Resyth. That appointment led to me being involved in developments at Titanic Quarter in Belfast, where we built the Titanic, and she was perfectly fine when she left us. We also, more recently and under that period, built the Titanic Studios, and if any of you have watched the Game of Thrones, that's where it was all filmed. Following the Good Friday Peace Agreement, I was invited to chair a multi-agency task force to promote conflict resolution and to try and improve the life outcomes of the most disadvantaged of our communities. I chaired a group with multiple former combatants on my committee. That was diplomatic language for prisoners former prisoners, former terrorists. We were going through a very difficult period in Belfast at one stage along the way. We were about to have a homecoming parade for a regiment of the Royal Irish Regiment coming back from Afghanistan. Half of our city was celebrating and half of the city was unhappy about it. Uh, a small portion of those who were unhappy were planning major civil disruption. They had already built the petrol bombs, as we call them, the Molotov cocktails. They had assembled their arsenal of weaponry to throw at the police. We got the committee together, and we had the people from one set of streets and another set of streets, and I somehow said to this side, You've got to hold your people back. The guy I was pointing my finger at had multiple convictions for terrorism, for murder. But God gave me that strength to point at that time. I turned to the others and said, and you have not got to respond to them. I lectured them. Our whole city prayed that this event would go off peacefully. As I said, they were prepared for destruction that could take our city back years in the peace process. And so the day came, and I remember it well, that the leader of the protesters arrived nose to nose with the chief constable of police in front of all the news cameras of the world and he handed a petition, a petition. There was some jeering, there was some catcalling, 
but the event went off largely peacefully. And so I felt it was important to celebrate. So we called the committee together again. I said, we need to celebrate. And the man with 58 convictions said to me, what have we got to celebrate? And I said, well, our city is not in flames. We have not gone backwards. We are still going forwards. And then I checked myself and I said to him, I have a book that I keep beside my bed that I like to read. And there is a story in it about a guy called Nehemiah. He was cupbearer to the king. And he used his place of influence with the king to go and say, my city is lying in ruins. Please give me a leave of absence that I might go and restore it. He, like us, is tasked with rebuilding our city. Nehemiah predicted that there would be countless people who would be standing against you, who would be sniping at your heels, who would be telling lies, who would be trying to stop you. He assembled the people along the work party with a trowel to build the wall in one hand and the sword in another. That scripture, I think it's uh, Nehemiah 4, 13 or thereabouts, is the life verse of one of the members of Congress I happen to know. Nehemiah was a cupbearer who called people to action. I have had the opportunity to spend time with those members of Congress because my work in Scotland, my work in Northern Ireland, ultimately connected me to members of Congress who were friends of Northern Ireland and friends of peace, without whom we wouldn't have had peace. The plan of God, that weaving together of circumstances that led to the call. I went to the prayer breakfast in Washington one year, which is the members of Congress prayer breakfast that goes all the way back to President Eisenhower. And three people said to me individually, I've got this crazy idea. You should relocate to the United States and become more involved as an ambassador of reconciliation. I went home to Karen, who said, <laughs> yeah, right. But we left it with God, and we prayed, and we believed, and we watched while he did it. And the miraculous things that have happened along the way that have given us that access I am a little bit like what a British cabinet secretary described as credible deniability. I have credentials. I have an all areas pass. I have a great parking space on Capitol Hill, uh, but I don't have a job. They can deny me. God looks after us and provides for us in that role. And I have been sent out as God's messenger to different places. I have held hands with kings and prime ministers in other countries. So the scripture and the prophecy that that man made over me 20 years before have all come to pass. And all the glory and honor goes to God for these things. Andrew Carnegie said, uh, if you can't write your business plan on the back of your business card, I don't want to see it. So in 14 words, we make ourselves available in Jesus' name as ambassadors of reconciliation to leaders worldwide. One of those mentors said to me, Mark, your greatest ability is your availability. Jesus gave us a radical example of availability. He came. He came to us. Jesus said, I give you an example to do as I have done. He said, love one another as I have loved you. And he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. That is our calling to be available, 
to be salt and light in the lives of others, to listen. One of my friends, Mark McIntyre, was speechwriter to President George Herbert Walker Bush, and he said the two most powerful four-letter words are love and with. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening, or this morning, and hopefully maybe some of you this evening. In fact, if you come this evening, I'm going to tell a story about the Titanic. I told you we come from the city that built it. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about a Titanic mistake the mistake that sank the world's most techni technologically advanced vessel, a catastrophic error that has implications for all of you here today. Each of you and your generation who are going to lead the world forward. I challenge members of Congress that's what you can do when you have a place in their midst, at their side, at their ear, as an attendant, as a cupbearer. There's no point in having that place and being in a respectful, loving relationship and not using that position to communicate a message. This country has become horribly divided since we moved here. I come from Northern Ireland, and I lived all my life through murder and mayhem. I do not want to see the United States go down the same path. When I was four years of age, I went to school for my first week. I was evacuated every day for a bomb scare. At the age of seven, we were sent to the back gate of school instead of the front gate one morning because somebody had been crucified on the railings of our school, tarred and feathered as a police informant. That is what extreme hatred does. And it is a spiral of decline. I challenge members, we, we have what we call the Centurion Challenge. I like to look at the accounts, not the stories, the accounts of the centurions in Scripture. Each of them was men in authority, but under authority. And each of them used their authority to speak up or to take action decisively. I think... Cornelius is perhaps my favorite centurion, without whom none of us would be here. Go read it and think about that. I say to members of Congress, who has the Lord put on your heart from the other side of the aisle? One of them said to me, nobody. I said, congressman. Who has the Lord put on your heart from the other side of the aisle? Well, he kind of shuffled his feet. And he said, well, and he mentioned the name of somebody, a member of Congress who shall remain nameless here, from New York. And he said, but he's crazy. I said, he may be crazy, Congressman, but the Lord put him on your heart. Why don't you go to him and reach out, invite him for a cup of coffee, we prefer tea, and uh, build a relationship. And build that relationship around the name and presence of Jesus. I mentioned the House of Representatives and the Senate prayer groups. Be encouraged. You will not hear this on the news. For 70 years, they have been meeting together, 
following the principles that Eisenhower encouraged to leave aside their faith denominational experiences and all the richness thereof and to leave aside their political differences and come together around the name and person of Jesus. Every Wednesday in the Senate and every Thursday in the House of Representatives, that is what happens. And I have seen men and women who are radically divided on politics become brothers and sisters in Christ. That is what happens when you raise the name of Jesus. That is what happens when you go around the world and meet with leaders who come from different faith traditions. Do not succumb to the lie that is prevalent today that we are not allowed to raise the name of Jesus, that, that it is politically incorrect. I met with uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahan. He's the ruler of the United Arab Emirates. He shook my hand. In fact, he held my hand. For 15 minutes we spoke with him holding my hand. And I said, Your Highness, these people in your country are following our scripture and praying for you and praying for leaders. They believe it is time that your country now became part of this international family of friends where we come together around that name. And he said, Mark, it is time. How can I help? He is a man of peace and tolerance. He is a man from the Muslim faith. I saw just this last week, he was in Moscow with Vladimir Putin. I'm sure you're all praying for peace because of the horrors of what's going on in Ukraine. I do not care who God's instrument of peace is, whether he is a Christian or she is a Christian. I care that they are taking risks for peace. So we are asked in our scripture to pray for all leaders, all leaders leaders. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3. Go check it out. All leaders, not the ones you vote for, not the ones you like, all leaders, so that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives. And also it goes on that all will be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. I am so thankful that there are cupbearers out there, that there are attendants out there. Don't just pray for the leaders. Pray for those who are in the next room. Pray for their counselors. Pray for their friends, that they may be bold, like Esther was bold at such a time as this, and spoke up. Speak up. We need our nation to speak up. I'm thankful, Martin that we are able to be here. Karen and I are looking forward to spending some time with some of you, and perhaps we'll see you tonight when we'll tell you about the Titanic mistake. For now, may God bless you. Thank you. Just by way of reminder, we have uh, time to chat with Mark and Karen if you want over coffee at the Tadlock House or at lunch today. Please do feel free to join us. And again tonight at 7 p.m. Please join me in thanking once again Mark Finley. <laughs>